In the licensed video game market, intellectual properties are represented by two separate yet equally important groups. The companies who make the games, and the nostalgic fans who defend them. These are their stories. But I'm not done yet. Heavy Iron dabbled into the world of SpongeBob SquarePants more than once. And honestly, I just think it's like pretty amazing that a company that was so unknown like Heavy Iron made two really good games back to back that, I mean, are just really accessible and enjoyable. That is extremely rare and I'm just glad it happened. The court is now in session for the trial of Truth or Square versus the public opinion. Is the defense ready? The defense is ready, Your Honor. Mr. Broccoli, your client stands accused of abusing consumer trust by misusing nostalgia to market itself to fans of two previous video games created by the same developer. There is a five-year gap between the release of your client and the release of two older titles created by the company Heavy Iron Studios. Given the situation, it would appear your client used the popularity of those two previous titles to sell more copies without having any inherent value of its own. You may present any counter evidence at this time. Your Honor, although my client is based around the same license as both Battle for Bikini Bottom and the SpongeBob movie game, to say it is riding on the coattails of those two games is unfair. Truth or Square has many creative elements that fans of both platforming video games and SpongeBob SquarePants can enjoy. And to illustrate this point, I have prepared something that is sure to change your mind. Ladies and gentlemen, I ask that you prepare to have your socks knocked off because this courtroom is about to experience some definitive evidence. Because once again, it is time for a nostalgic goddamn montage. You got robots, stiggies, tongues, and more. You can fight your way to a robot's core. Vibrant colors and funny lines, collectibles, it's got all kinds. Too many time trials can make a man sick, so no more levels as hard as my dick. Mr. Broccoli, turn off your goddamn boombox. You let one parrot testify and suddenly your whole career is a joke. My apologies, Your Honor. This is kind of just a thing I do. Yell excessively? No, but... Well, yes, but that's not the point. None of this is acceptable evidence. This is literally all I prepared. And it shows. Look, Mr. Broccoli, your passionate defense is commendable, but your display here today has only proven one thing, that your close personal connection to your client's predecessors has blinded you. Did you not just call your own defense a nostalgic montage? Your Honor, please. Let me finish. Your client may have tried to stand on its own, but it doesn't. You may not be able to see that, but it's true. Everything you listed in your outburst was done not just years earlier, but better. Truth or Square is nothing but a shadow of the games you loved as a child. And quite frankly, I'm having doubts about the reputation of those games as well. No, this, this can't be happening. Take a good look, Mr. Broccoli. It may be time to admit that your childhood can't stay with you forever. No, I, I won't let this happen. The court sees no further reason to prolong this trial. I find the defendant... OBJECTION! There comes a point in everyone's life when they realize that they're now old enough to reflect back on the things they loved as a child. A time to see if those things are still deserving of praise, or if it's time to let them go. And for me, that day is today. There are many things that are precious to me from my childhood, and many of them still hold up today, but you all know what the point of this video is and what I want to talk about. On October 31st, 2003, Heavy Iron Studios created SpongeBob SquarePants Battle for Bikini Bottom, a 3D open world platformer that, although it did not make a huge splash critically, went on to become a player's choice for every console it appeared on. Nostalgic fans often declare it online as one of the most underrated games of all time, one of the best licensed games of all time, and so on. And of course, I agree. And with one hit title under their belt, Heavy Iron did not stop there. Released only a year later on October 27th, 2004, the video game adaptation of the SpongeBob SquarePants movie was released. Although not mentioned as often as its older sibling, the movie game retained much of what made its predecessor great, trying out a more linear format and upping the challenge significantly. Both games are remembered for their vibrant graphics, excellent music, and more than any other SpongeBob video game released at the time, or even since, for their gameplay and level design that perfectly fit the cartoon world of Bikini Bottom. And if things went as originally planned, the SpongeBob SquarePants cartoon would end with the premiere of the 2004 movie, leaving a legacy of episodes that both kids and adults could enjoy, and two much-loved video games. But as we all know, Nickelodeon wanted to continue the cartoon series, and so it did, and to this day it still airs, being seen by an entirely new generation of children. But today we'll be revisiting a time when Duke Nukem Forever was still a joke, and when Charlie Sheen was still alive. Welcome back to 2009. SpongeBob fans could count themselves lucky to have gotten not just one, but two exceptional video games, and although SpongeBob games were still being made by other companies, none could match the quality of the two games we held dear to our hearts. But 
Heavy Iron wasn't done. They made a third Spongebob game. They made a trilogy. Not an official trilogy, mind you, but in all but name, it is one. Just, just roll with it. To coincide with the release of Spongebob's 10th anniversary special, Heavy Iron returned after five years to make the official adaptation of Truth or Square. This was obviously a big deal, as Spongebob was and still is Nickelodeon's most profitable show and the only show still airing from the 90s. Spongebob had longtime loyal fans of the show. Fans who bought all the merchandise, fans who knew every line of dialogue, and even fans who made this sort of... thing. But we don't talk about those fans! Ever! But more importantly, Spongebob had fans who loved the video games as well. Unfortunately for these specific fans, 2009 was not going to be their year. The game we got did not live up to our expectations. Mistakes were made that need to be addressed, and this game needs to be brought to justice, so I as a fan can put this to rest. Hey, you know what time it is? It's disclaimer time! I want to point out that I primarily played the Wii version of this game, although I did play the 360 version as well. The Wii version does in fact have motion controls, but I would like to stress, they are optional, so any criticisms about them aren't super important or relevant. And hey! Why don't we start like we did last time? Well, this time around, the game ditched the traditional Mario 64, Banjo-Kazooie style of mission-based collectibles and went for a more linear approach than its predecessor. Now, you could apply this statement to the Spongebob movie game, but somehow this statement still applies to Truth or Square. Like, they somehow found a way to make a game more linear than an already linear game. Instead of multiple missions per level, you now only have to make it to the end of a level to progress. One consequence of this change is that there is much less focus on exploration. This is a diagram of what a generic level in this game looks like. A straight path with small branches that shoot off and end almost immediately. Now obviously, the movie game also has straightforward levels, but its levels look more like this. A series of decently sized connected rooms that, although nowhere near as massive as the worlds of Battle for Bikini Bottom, hid secret paths and side missions for you to explore as you travel to the end of a level. I still miss things when playing through that game, but looking for secrets in Truth or Square is as simple as going through a level and spotting the obvious Tiki Snails. The annoying part about this is that the Tiki Snails, which present challenges in return for the majority of a level's collectibles, only unlock after you beat the level once. Replaying levels for collectibles is fine in a game, and that's basically how the LEGO series works, but this is just shallow padding since the secrets aren't super well hidden and the challenges you do to get rewards are simplistic and repetitive. At the very least, the warp boxes are back, meaning you don't have to waste your time redoing entire levels. But sadly, the teleportation feature is gone. Sometimes you just can't have nice things. The main gameplay of Truth or Square has remained relatively intact. Battle for Bikini Bottom is generally considered to be a very easy game, but it has a very good mix of interesting platforming sections that blend together well with its combat sections. The movie game decided that this was stupid, and snorted as much cocaine as possible while adding lots of harder enemies and lasers. Because you can never have too many lasers, right? Actually, yes you can, you can have way too many. The platforming was still at the forefront of this game, but the real challenge came from the enemies and the larger focus on the sliding sections and the all-new racing sections. From where I see it, Truth or Square tones down the platforming while still having more frequent and more repetitive combat sections. Not a single platforming section reaches the same insane levels of cool that Squidward's Dream or Patrick's Challenge levels did. You just sort of hop onto any platform that's in front of you, or hit a switch if there isn't one. Wall jumping is gone, grappling is gone, there are fewer obstacles, and overall the platforming is just less difficult. That being said, the jumping and running control is just as great as you're used to. I want to stress just how few games get these sort of things right. I mean, geez, if your whole game is about running and jumping, then please, 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 make sure you don't screw this up! That still leaves combat to talk about, however, and unfortunately it isn't super engaging this time around. Although fighting groups of enemies to progress is nothing new to the series, you never had to do it as much as you do in this game. You frequently have to dispatch enemies to fulfill an arbitrary quota, destroy enemies so you can solve a puzzle uninterrupted, or just to collect an extra. And honestly, I just think the combat mechanics are weaker in this game. In the past, regular enemies would take, at most, two hits to die. Smaller enemies, the ones literally called fodder enemies, only took one hit to kill. Some enemies were best taken out with certain attacks, and even stronger enemies suffered from knockback. None of that is true in this game. Enemies spawn in large groups, often swarming you. The lack of knockback means enemies that you hit are briefly stunned, but they quickly snap out of it to continue attacking. But this just means that more and more robots can come around and surround you, meaning at least one robot is going to be able to hit you in between one of your attack animations. And even this wouldn't be a problem if the robots didn't take so many hits to die. The most basic enemies take at least two hits, and later enemies in the game can take up to four. You get no visual indicator of an enemy's health, so you can't judge the risks of rushing in to finish off a specific enemy. These fights are everywhere and get extremely repetitive because you only have two basic attacks, which are essentially the exact same attack. By simplifying the combat, it removes any strategy and thus any challenge from the fights, making for an overall dull experience. But hey, let's not be too hard on this game, they fixed at least one thing that was wrong with the last two games, the vertically panning camera. Remember this mess? Yeah? Well, it's much slower in Truth or Square, so the camera, at least, took a step forward. Before it immediately took two steps back. 
Okay, so they may have fixed one nitpick, but we still ended up with a camera that is never on the player's side. I think this clip is evidence enough for that. This is not helpful. You will end up with a camera getting stuck on the sides of levels quite often, as the levels in this game aren't nearly as wide open as they were in the past. You spend a lot of time in narrow hallways that aren't too keen on letting you turn the camera around. But even if you were close to a wall in the past two games, the camera would just zoom in and not glitch out as often as it does here. Before you could rotate the camera seamlessly, but here the camera snags and jitters around a lot. How do you mess up something that you perfected six years earlier? You need to be able to move the camera around on the fly because you're often surrounded by enemies who wind up hitting you just because you didn't see them. I find it baffling how almost two decades after Mario 64 pioneered the 3D platforming genre that we still have games that don't have a functioning camera system. By the way, since we're talking about basic functionality, the camera in this game isn't the only thing that experiences glitches. Here is a clip of me walking around on a boat. Here is that clip again. And this one time, the karate level boss, you know, just chilled out for a bit. No, man, it's fine. Like, take care of yourself. Seriously, it's you need to focus on you right now. You do you. Now, to be fair, combat and platforming weren't the only things that made the old SpongeBob game so great. One of those things were the different characters that you could play as for tackling different types of challenges. So, what cool new characters? Oh wait! It's funny because we actually have less characters to play as, and the last sentence would lead you to believe otherwise, so you would feel the same level of disappointment when I realized that you could only play a Spongebob in this game. Yay! Characters like Patrick, Sandy, and Squidward are sidelined to invincibility power-ups, because what self-respecting game has anything less than four different invincibility power-ups? Good on you, Truth or Square. You give your players options. Okay. Whatever, it's not that big a deal, because instead of different characters, we got multiplayer! Except it's basically a Plankton-themed version of Mario Galaxy's co-op system. Oh! At the very least, it's simple, unobtrusive, and most importantly, it works, so it's fine with me. But hey, different characters weren't the only cool thing about the old games. What about power-ups? This game has those, right? If by that you mean Nightmare Fuel, then yeah. It has that. You have three main abilities in this game. The smash attack, the spin attack, and the shooting attack. You begin with only the smash attack, but you slowly unlock more mechanics as you encounter them in the levels. The smash and spin attacks feel really similar and almost redundant, as the differences between them boil down to which type of switches they can activate. They're essentially interchangeable beyond that, though. The cannon form that SpongeBob can unlock uses water balloon ammo for use in some simple puzzles, and can also be used as an attack. The problem here is that the puzzles boil down to just turning some bumpers so that you can shoot a button. It can be useful in combat, but unless you want to wait for a few seconds to aim, you can never really tell where your shots are going to go, and even then, they barely feel like they do anything. One of the other main mechanics is the water spray, which is extremely contextual and it's used to inflate certain platforms. It isn't so much a cool new ability as it is a form that slows you down, makes you a bigger target, and just a way to pad out the game a bit more. Honestly, the only new mechanics that I feel deserve any recognition are riding the bomb robots and the gum launchers, if only because they give you a break from the endless robot smashing. Oh, and you can also make Spongebob fucking jack to shit, oh my god, to do more damage. Overall, I feel like this is a huge step back from the power-ups of the past games, not only because they were more diverse and cool looking, but they added to the gameplay without breaking up the flow of movement. The spin attacks didn't stop you in place unlike the smash attack in this game. The bubble bowl let you aim before shooting and it actually felt like it had some weight behind it. The up smashes and the ground slams meant you could attack in all three directions and you could even shoot a guided missile with the sonic wave guitar or the cruise bubble. That isn't even mentioning Sandy's lasso maneuvers or Patrick's throwing abilities. The old movesets were extensions of the player, allowing you to integrate attacks into platforming as well as puzzle solving. The abilities in Truth or Square are just glorified button pressing mechanics. This game adores its buttons and switches, even more so than its older siblings, if you can believe that. They even tell you where you have to stand half the time. Look, this game is by no means terrible, but you don't have to be terrible to be boring. And boring is the best way to describe the gameplay. Five years should mean improvement, not regression. But then again, those five years means Truth or Square has the advantage of running on two more powerful consoles, doesn't it? So in this game's favor, it definitely knocked one thing out of the park. Because as much as people, myself included, like to bash this game, this game is exactly how an HD remake of a Spongebob game should look. Even on the Wii, this game looks pretty damn good. But oh my god, the 360 version. Look at these particle effects in the sun rays. Look at the superb lighting effects in the Mermelair. And just look at how many little details they have packed into Spongebob's house. And I dare you to ignore these textures. These had to be hand-painted and drawn. They look like something you'd see in a background of the show. All the colors are vibrant and the models are crisp and solid. We've come a long way since Revenge of the Flying Dutchman. The expression Spongebob makes when he transforms aren't the most pleasant to look at, but it's far better than the stuff we saw in Creature from the Krusty Krab. That was a bit too stylistic for my tastes. 
The cartoony style of the show comes across without being too exaggerated or stylistic, and it's what a modern HD Spongebob game should look like. As easy as it is to dislike the current show's content, the animation quality has improved drastically since the first episode, just like how this game looks better than its older siblings. You have to give Heavy Iron credit. The game looks wonderful, and it's one of the main pieces of evidence that show people at least try to make this game good. But what's this other main evidence that I'm talking about? Ten years of frustration. Ten long years of chasing after that formula. I almost had it that time, too. Oh, the anguish. The humiliation. Ah! Well, I'll try again tomorrow. Well, it's the fact that the game came way closer to being a 10th anniversary special than the episode ever did. For what was supposed to be the biggest celebration of one of the most recognizable cartoons of the 2000s, Truth or Square is widely regarded as a disappointment. For older fans like me, it was almost as if the current showrunners had no idea what made the show great in the first place, and for younger fans, if you removed the 29 minutes of live-action shots, there was very little left that would indicate that this was anything more than a run-of-the-mill episode. It's not a well-kept secret that Spongebob isn't the same show it was before the first movie, and even at its best, the current episodes can maybe get one or two smiles out of me. For example, Truth or Square just had too many cameos from celebrities who just seem so out of left field. How would you, LeBron James, like to be a guest on the fan club McGoracle special for Spongebob? I love Spongebob, man, but I can't, man. I have a game today, I'm sorry. Don't lie to me, LeBron! I know you didn't play that day! Then you had the trailer teasers they showed, with Spongebob and Sandy getting married, and Mr. Krabs revealing the secret formula. And those turned out to be nothing more but red herring cutaways that had little impact on the actual episode. And perhaps the most baffling thing is while the episode contained fake clip show segments of things like Plankton getting thrown out of the Krusty Krab. Like instead of showing montages of old episode moments, they made new content and had montages of that that had no significance to anybody watching. If you want to make a clip show, then just do it. Friends did it like 27 times in 10 years, nobody is going to mind. Honestly, I would have been happy with a clip show for the 10th anniversary special. And you know what? Heavy Iron knew what was up. The show and the game don't share a plot, and I am pretty sure that Truth or Square is the first video game ever to be a clip show. Allow me to quote myself from a year ago. The makers of this game clearly love Spongebob because this is a nostalgic overload. Now yes, I am aware that five years is a lot of time for a company to reorganize its staff, and yes, beyond a couple of artists and some programmers, you mostly have a completely new team working on this game. But if there is one thing that each entry in the unofficial trilogy of Spongebob games has, it is respect for the source material. Truth or Square's plot focuses on Spongebob trying to remember where the Krabby Patty formula is hidden, and with the help of Plankton, Spongebob revisits his happiest memories to help him remember better. This is obviously a trick of Plankton's, and Spongebob's memories are warped and blended together with a much larger concentration of robots than before. And this is actually really, really cool for the most part. Heavy Iron made the game an actual clip show, where each of the ten memories you revisit are based on actual episodes, and the episodes they chose are from the first few seasons of the show. This obviously strikes a chord with me. You get to meet Sandy for the first time, you get to meet Mermaid Man and Barnacle Boy, survive the hash-slinging slasher, and fight your way into the Salty Spittoon. These are excellent setting choices to explore, and the kid in me loves seeing references to episodes I haven't seen in years. The plot isn't a piece of masterful writing by any means, and it's kinda hard to feel like the plot has any consequence when most of it takes place in Spongebob's consciousness, but hey, it's still way better than the show. One problem though was that the theming of some of the levels feels a bit contrived and shoved together just so the game can reuse assets. The hash lane slasher level is actually more of a rock bottom level that is suspiciously similar to another rock bottom level we all know, and also now that we're men from the movie game. We also have two different jungle themed levels for meeting Sandy and Karate Island, as well as two jellyfish fields levels for jellyfishing and becoming a fry cook. And even the completely original levels just seem lazy, with the Christmas episode taking place in a freezer with the occasional Christmas light hanging in the background. Now although this is disappointing, the game makes up for this with a bevy of references to the show. Each level has different items to collect that are recognizable from the show, like Squidward's Christmas clarinet, Sandy's iced tea, and the Winnie Hut Jr. dog. And then we have the references just scattered around the game, like the Kelp Forest campsite, the sardines, the suits in the Mermelair, and these two NPCs who have the specific Christmas gifts they got in the Christmas episode. These people care about Spongebob, that can't be denied. You can even get art packs in the game that show concept art, costumes for all the characters, and you can even spend money to upgrade all the furniture in Spongebob's house. And yes, you do get to walk around Spongebob's house. Although it's clearly not as impressive as having all of Bikini Bottom as a hub world, this game could just as easily have been a level select screen. There are so many little details in this game that people clearly spend time on. All the cute little idol animations, how the Tiki's look scared just as you're about to destroy them. And look! Look at these motherfuckers doing Grease Lightning! Fucking Grease Lightning! That would take like an afternoon to program! And just like old times, the majority of the voice actors reprised their roles, and the lip syncing is better than ever. Mr. Krabs is gonna fire me twice! Don't worry, SpongeBob. We'll make you so happy you'll remember the Alamo! Sandy! You lost that battle! People died!
Regardless of how this game compares to its siblings, it's at least clear that this game was being made by fans. We don't know how long they had to make this game, and corners probably had to be cut. Although, some corners are more obvious than others. We have a pretty big elephant in the room that I was going to have to address at some point. The music. Anyone who has never played the first two games might think that Truth is Square has a surprisingly diverse and well-composed soundtrack. And it does. But then again, it's hardly impressive when you find out that the newest song in that game was five years old at that point. To many people's disappointment, the entirety of Truth is Square's soundtrack is reused from its older siblings as well as the show. I realize that after basically calling this game the video game equivalent of a clip show, that complaining about reused music is kind of dumb, but given how good the old soundtracks are, it would have been nice to hear some cool new songs. There are a lot of songs used in this game, and very few are used in more than one place, which would normally be pretty great. Except that's the problem with reusing old music. You didn't write the music to match the levels, so you made the levels and then cherry picked the songs that sound like they fit the best there. So some obvious choices of the Jellyfish Fields, Rock Bottom, and Kelp Forest themes from Battle for Beginning Bottom when they're used in the levels of the same location. That's cool, that makes sense. But then we have the weird ones, like Goo Lagoon, a beach theme used in the ice level. No. Why? What? No. What? What? No! 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 Stop it! This isn't okay! This isn't okay! The whole game feels like they're saying, Hey, remember this song? What about this song? Wasn't this song great? Yeah, we get it. They were great. But the reason we liked those songs was not just because they were good songs, but because they matched their levels so well. I spend more time talking about game music than most people because I'm a huge fan of it, and I also think that it plays a large part in trying to immerse a player in a situation. Throwing music into a level with little regard to how it fits into the level's tone is not okay. I don't think I'm the only person who gets irritated every time the game's music is interrupted to play an unfittingly upbeat and happy tune whenever you get a power-up. And the reuse of all this music just fits into an overall theme of a game that is less inspired, more repetitive, and formulaic. Let's make a list of all the enemies in this game just to illustrate this point. So right off the bat you have the twirly robot, the hammer robot, the bomb robot, and the projectile robot. Next you have the yellow twirly robot, and the yellow hammer robot, I guess? And after that, you have the big twirly robot and the big hammer robot, because of course it does. But you also have the duplicator, and is that even... I don't know what that is. Um, okay. I think you get the picture. These enemy designs are just really, really generic. I realize that taken on its own that this game is just a standard run-of-the-mill platformer, but when the same company has done the same sort of game in the past, and done it better, and twice no less, comparisons have to be made. I can list off all the enemy types from the last two games because I remember them for being funny, unique, and memorable. I remember the little details about each enemy because they were all so different and distinct. Remember how great it was that the hammer robot was actually hitting you with a piece of ham? And did you know that if your system's internal clock was set to different holidays, the triplet robots had different colored fire? Heavy Iron has done robots before and they did them extremely well. That's not even touching on the movie game's bucketheads. We're missing the inspired enemies the first two games had, and it's just a bit disappointing as a longtime fan that we don't get the same level of creativity that we saw years ago. Well actually, there is one exception, and it's probably the most famous part of this game. And that part is Robot Squidward. The reason this boss is so well known is yet again due to the cult level of fandom that Battle for Bikini Bottom has. Some memorable pieces of concept art from that game depict a boss battle against a robot version of Squidward, which itself is in the same vein as the robot Sandy, Spongebob, Patrick, and Plankton fights. It's weird, but playing this boss fight makes me genuinely happy. Not only is it based off one of my favorite episodes, the whole thing has this sense of grandeur to it that makes you feel like a kid again. I mean, look at it! It looks like something straight out of your childhood. Honestly though, the fight is pretty run-of-the-mill, and even then it's the best boss fight in the game. We get a bunch of mini-boss encounters with some generic robots that mostly make you wait until the boss is done doing some attack, and then going in to hit it either 3, 6, 9, or whatever arbitrary number of times. A lot of their attacks are unavoidable if you get too close to a corner, and getting hit often sends you flying around the arena. They are pretty forgettable. You do get a rematch against Robot Patrick where you get to use your hammer attack to pound him over and over in the oh my god! And then we have the final boss, where you fight against a giant chum bucket robot that's rampaging through downtown Bikini Bottom, and you defeat it by going inside and destroying its core while fighting off a few smaller robots. Here's the problem. We've done this exact same thing before. Except last time the scale was bigger, the giant robot had more variety in its attacks, the smaller enemies were tougher, and instead of slowly jumping from building to building, you're frantically trying to run away from a psychotic one-eyed robot trying to kill you with lasers. Truth or Square is trying to be epic, but it can't, because it's constantly overshadowed by its siblings. How do you top the crazy robot Swindra battle from the first game? Well, you make an insane rock-themed laser fight against King Neptune, and you pair both these battles with some of the most badass songs to any final boss ever. With that information, I think you can understand why this power-up music was a stupid, stupid decision.
In almost every way, Truth or Square is trying to be Battle for Bikini Bottom 2.0, but it falls short in every single category. Notice how a large number of the levels were a location already used in Battle for Bikini Bottom, but now smaller, linear, and just less interesting? What about all the reused assets? Remember the sliding levels from the last two games and how awesome they were, especially how Spongebob used his tongue? Well, those parts are back, except they're slower, you can't jump or attack, and they happen on a level surface. Do you remember Prawn? He was cool, right? Oh, and do you remember the Tiki's and the shiny objects? Good, because we added three times as many! The game wants to remind you of how great old Spongebob and old Spongebob video games were, and that is perfectly fine. But the game itself doesn't bring anything new to the table to justify an existence of its own. This game has the foundations of a good game, and quite frankly, there are far worse games out there that are either a chore to play, do not look and sound this good, or they're just plain broken. But there is a big difference between constructing a good foundation and designing a good game, and Truth or Square just got lost somewhere between those two points. This game isn't good or bad, it's oh my god, oh my god, that's it! OBJECTION! OBJECTION! I swear, if you take another magic stone out of your pocket... Please, Your Honor, give me one more chance. You suggested that the reason I'm defending this game is because my judgment is clouded by my personal attachment to the games of my childhood. And that, I admit I'm guilty of. I want Truth is Square to be a great game because I want my frankly unrealistic dreams to come true. I want another fantastic Spongebob game. Very good, Mr. Broccoli. But I assume since you yelled objection that you still have a point to make? Yes, Your Honor. My client has flaws. That can't be denied. However, my client also has good qualities, qualities that are often ignored. My client's harshest critics are not who you would expect. In any other context, they would treat this game the same as everyone else would. But these people have already played Battle for Bikini Bottom. These people have already played the Spongebob movie game. They may have even played other Spongebob games before this one, and in their eyes, Truth is Square is a failure after a triumph. Taken on its own, it has nothing remarkable or special, but taken as the third installment in a series of well-loved games, Truth is Square is practically an insult. Are you saying what I think you're saying? Your Honor, my client isn't a good game, nor is it a bad game. It's an average game. A mediocre game. It deserves to be played and forgotten. The defense rests. Very well. After hearing all the evidence here today, my mind is made up. SpongeBob SquarePants. Truth or Square is hereby found to be... Wait! What's the verdict? I don't know. Who cares? Oh my god. This isn't a real court. Because courts have juries. So why don't you guys be the jury? Leave a comment because I genuinely want to know what you guys think of this game. But anyway, hey, thanks so much for watching this stupidly long video about Spongebob video games. It's been a year since the video that sort of put my channel on the map, so thank you for all the support you've given me over the past year. It means a lot to be able to just come home and read your comments and you guys liking my video, so thank you so much. But an even bigger thanks for lol Eric lol for doing the awesome Law & Order intro, and also my dad. Y yes my dad. For playing the judge. They made this really stupid idea for a video actually feasible, so I want to thank them so much for helping me do this. And anyway, if you want to check out any of my other Spongebob videos mentioned in this video, click on these links, or just check out my channel for other video game based content. Once again, thank you, and I'm gonna go sleep for once in my life. I'm, I'm so tired.